But I do have the word of the Lord this morning, and I've got some really good news. Do you want to hear some good news? Hands up if you want to hear some good news. All right, here's the good news. You ready? Jesus is coming back. That's true. That's good news for most of you. It really is true. Okay, let's do this. Let's just establish something. Hands up if you're a visitor here for the first time. Okay, this is the deal, right? You have to be really responsive. Because if you're not responsive, I think maybe they're not quite getting it. So then I'll say it again, and I'll just be here for a really long time. So if you're like really interactive, and I know we're, we're from Bath, I'm a Bath boy too, but we can still like, yeah, good. So if I feel like there's some response, I'll go faster. <laughs> ah, now I need a sozo. Great. All right, um, Acts chapter one. On one occasion, While he was eating with them, he gave them this command. This is Jesus. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said, it is not for you to know the times or the dates that my father has set by his own authority, but, everyone say but, but "But you will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up from their sight before their eyes, and a cloud hid them. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood to their side and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come back in the same way that you have seen him go, that's good news. Here's another question for you. Hands up if you believe, just one more time, you believe that Jesus is going to come back. Okay, keep your hands up if you believe he's going to come back in your lifetime. Ooh, split room now. Okay, hands up again. I believe Jesus is going to come back in my lifetime. It's a great question, isn't it? Because I think we can all agree there's certain things that need to take place before Jesus comes back. And when you look at the state of the world and you look at the state of the church, which is the answer for the world, you can think, I'm not sure how this is possible. Now, the truth is, God can restore everything just like that. He could. But he has chosen in his sovereignty. And if you read the New Testament, there's not one metaphor that is big enough or glorious enough to explain the complexity and awesomeness of the church. So Paul calls the church a bride, and then he calls it a, an army, and then he calls it a building, and then he calls it a body, and Jesus calls it a vine. So is it a building? Is it, is it, a, a, is it a functioning body? Which, which is it? But whatever metaphor the New Testament uses, it's pointing towards a process and something that is taking place on the earth, and it's the church, everyone say church, that is raising and rising up like a sleeping giant. He's coming back for a bride that has made herself ready, a body that is fitly joined together, a house that is made of living stones, living stones, that's us, where God himself can make his presence. He's coming back for a, for a vine that is fruitful, that is bearing fruit and fruit that remains. So there is work that needs to be done. One of my favorite words in the Bible is the word until. Will you say that with me? Just so I know you're still with me. He must remain in heaven until, until the restoration of all things has taken place. As surely as I live, says the Lord, Numbers says, 
All the earth will be filled with my glory as the waters cover the sea. He must wait until all enemies have been made a footstool for his feet. Until every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. Ephesians 4 says that God has given apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers to equip God's people until we all reach the unity of the faith and come to the full stature of Christ, which has not yet happened. That's why that word is until is the operative word. It's the important word because it's until. Until the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. Until this gospel has been preached to, every, to all creation and then the end will come. Church, there's things that have to happen. So it's a provocative question. If not, why not? What needs to happen until the skies will open up, the trumpet sounds, and the king of glory comes to collect his bride that is glorious, that is without spot or wrinkle. She's just absolutely radiant. She's gorgeous. She's stunning, like an army with banners, like a body that is fitly joined together, functioning under the direction of the head. Like a family whose God is our father and we get to be his kids. A vine that is fruitful and bearing fruit and bearing fruit. Living letters that make sense when we're all together, making sentences that the world can read. I shouldn't really do this, but I'm just going to give you a taster that next year, 2020, the 2020 vision that is percolating in some of the leaders right now is found, is a, is a scripture, it's in Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11. And it says, in light of this, in fact, I'm going to read this scripture in a moment. In light of all these things, Peter says, what kind of people ought we to be? And for 2020 vision, the 2020 vision is simply this, people. For God so loved people. You know, God loves people. And if we love God, we'll love what God loves. And what God loves is people. So we're going to give ourselves to People, to reaching people. Isaiah 61 says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he's anointed me too. The anointing isn't just for us. The anointing is upon us because he has anointed us to something. He's anointed us to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to release from captivity those who are bound and those who are in darkness, to comfort those who mourn and for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. <coughs> Gladness for sadness. Church, that's what we're anointed for. We're on a series go right now from Daniel eleven thirty two. 32. Those who know their God will be strong and do great exploits. And so this next few weeks, while I have the privilege of being here, I'm not sure what all these weeks are going to look like. I want to provoke you. Are, are you okay with that? Are you okay? You know, in Hebrews, it says this. The writer of Hebrews says, consider how you may spur one another on towards good deeds. Consider, think about how you can provoke one another. And I want to provoke us. I like being provoked. I like to be challenged. A spur is those, that little wheel that was on the back of a cowboy boot. For when he's riding a horse, he would kick the horse, which would cause the, the, the horse to jolt forward. So are you okay if I cause you to jolt forward today? Are, are you okay? You sure? Because you went really quiet again. So I'm thinking maybe I need to just go a bit slower. A bit slower? Faster? Okay. All right. Just making sure. Okay. Okay. Isaiah chapter 2 says, In the last days... The mountain of the Lord will be the chief of all mountains. And the world will say to Zion, the church, teach us your ways. I am convinced with every facet of my being 
that Jesus is going to come back when the church becomes the mountain of the Lord and becomes a voice to the nations where the world will stream to Zion and they will say, the world will say, teach us your ways because I believe the answer to depression is found in the gospel. It's found on the cross. And the, the answer to debt, the answer to raising children, to having an amazing marriage is found in the gospel. And the church have the answers. So we got to get going. To be a voice. To have something to say to a world about death, about sex, about depression, finances, business. We have the answers. Amen. So that's good. Glad we talked about that. But it starts with me. Everyone say me. me. So Jesus gave them, this, they gave them this instruction. I want you to wait here in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. Wait here in Jerusalem. Have you ever stopped to wonder what would happen if they hadn't? It's like, yeah, we've just been waiting for so long. Nothing seems to be happening. Ah, this prayer meeting is taking way too long. I've got stuff to do. Jesus says we've got to go into all the world. But he tells them and he gives us instruction. I want you to wait here in Jerusalem until you have received power from on, on high. And they, they said to him, oh Lord, are you at this time going to, going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And so they started talking about eschatology. They started to, to ask Jesus, how's the world going to end? What's going to happen? He says, I'm not interested in talking about that. That's up to my father. But, but you will receive power dynamite, dunamis. You will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Why? So that you can be my witnesses right here in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then to the ends of the earth. So it starts with me. And here's where I want to provoke us today, that in the Bible, wherever there is a promise, there is an if. And so often as charismatics... We love the promises of God. But we sometimes fail to remember that there is a prefix. If you wait in Jerusalem, you will receive power from on high. That's the New Testament, Old Testament. If you wait on the Lord, Isaiah says, you will renew your strength. I just need to be renew my strength like the eagles. But first of all, hit wherever there's a promise, there's an if. First of all, we have to wait on the Lord. You ready for another one? New Testament. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink, and streams of living water will flow from within him. If, if anyone is thirsty. First of all, we have to be thirsty. Old Testament. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. If. But Lord, were you going to heal the land? Well, if you humble yourself and pray. New Testament. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. Wherever there's a promise, there's an if. If you first believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, then you will be saved. Old Testament. If you consecrate yourself today, Joshua says, tomorrow, God says, I will do amazing things amongst you. Wherever there's a promise, there's an if. If you draw near to God, James says, I will draw near to you. Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. If you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. Wherever there's a promise, there's an if. Old Testament. If brothers and sisters will dwell together in unity, God will command a blessing. Therefore, the opposite must be true. If there's, it must be true. If there's not unity, there's not the commanded blessing of the Lord. If two, or two of you agree on anything in my name, it will be bound here on earth as it is in heaven. Because what is bound in heaven will be bound here on earth. New Testament. Okay, are you sure? I'm just getting, I'm just getting a little quiet, Tim. New Testament, repent then, and times of refreshing will come to you. New Testament, Acts. Repent, repent means to change your mind. If you repent, if you change your mind, times of refreshing will come to you. So if you're going the wrong way, turn around and go the right way. And the promise is, and times of refreshing will come to you. 
Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, Jesus says, and all these things will be added unto you as well. Where's all the things? Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Lord, where's the desires of my heart? If you delight yourself in me, then I'll give you the desires of your heart. If you take the plank out of your own eye, then you'll see clearly to take out the speck in your brother's eye. If you take out the plank in your own eye, then you will be, be able to see clearly the speck in your brother's eye. In other words, Jesus is saying, hey, listen, if you look at yourself first, then you'll see clearly, and you'll probably see how minute the issue is in someone else if you first look at yourself. Mm. <laughs> Whew, it's getting hot in here. If you bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, there'll be food in my house. If, test me in this, says the Lord God Almighty, and see that I don't open the windows of heaven and pour out so much blessing on you that you don't even know what to do with it. I'll read that one again. I think anybody got that. You know, often when I read my Bible, and I get to the end of the Old Testament, there's a little page, and it says, New Testament. <laughs> but, you know, that wasn't actually in the original canon, that little page that says New Testament. <laughs> so if you took that out, you just can keep reading. And you'll find that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. revealed. It's like two supporting acts that don't make sense on their own. Should I say that again? Okay, are we going to speed up a little bit? Okay, let's, I want to turn some scriptures. Can we get into the words together? I'm going to pray. Because you are not helping. <laughs> Holy Spirit, we thank you for your word. We thank you that this is your voice in print. We thank you that this is the only book that we'll ever read where you, the author, are always present. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're present in this room. We thank you for the way that you love us. We thank you that you are absolutely committed to, to, you, to you yourself, Christ, being fully formed in us. So Holy Spirit, I ask, even through the foolishness of preaching, that today that you will bring your word to life and you will wing it into our hearts, that it would take root and bear fruit and fruit that remains in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. If you can turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 14. Genesis, chapter 14. While you're turning there, I'm going I'm to read from Hebrews, chapter 5, and verse 8. Called by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 5. We have much to say about this. But, you are, it, this, but it is hard to explain this to you, the writer of Hebrews says, because you're slow to learn. I'm not talking about you. It's just your friends who aren't here. Right. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths about God and his word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Now read that again. Called by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. We have much to say about this, but you are slow to learn. In fact, by this time, you ought to be teachers but you need someone to teach you the elementary truths about God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature, who by constant use, everyone say constant use, have trained themselves to distinguish between good and evil. The word of God works through constant use. 
because it's alive. And so I want to talk about a subject that we don't talk about very often, especially in Great Britain. There's got to be money. Case in point. Thank you, Anne. And we just don't talk about money, but Jesus talks so much about money. So I'm going to go really slow? Like really, really slow? Okay. <laughs> so I really want to talk to people this morning that want to eat steak, that want to eat mature food. And because this is the context that the writer of Hebrews is writing about the order of Melchizedek. And so if you can turn to um, Genesis chapter 14, and we're just going to start laying this. I'm not sure I'm going to get much of this done today, but we've got, a, we've got some time together over this next month. So Genesis chapter 14. Then Melchizedek, everybody say Melchizedek, <laughs> king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high, and he blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abraham, or Abraham as he was then, gave him a tenth, or a tithe, of everything. Melchizedek is a type and shadow of Christ Jesus himself. Melchizedek means son of righteousness. Salem, king of Salem, means is the same word shalom. And those, many of you know this, but shalom means peace and well-being. And in this passage, we see three key things. We see bread, we see wine, and we see tithe, which means a tenth. Bread. To make bread, it has to be beaten. It has to be kneaded. And the Bible says that Jesus is the bread of life. He was punished. He was beaten for us. It goes into an oven. Jesus went into a tomb. He is our bread. He is our life. Wine, to make wine, has to be crushed. Gethsemane means the place of crushed. But Jesus' blood was spilt for us. We're going to break bread in a minute as a whole church family. And God's going to do something amazing. Do you like breaking bread? Okay, good. I like breaking bread. But he was bruised for us. He was crushed for us to make a covenant. Galatians chapter 3. Some of you can go back and you can look at these texts yourselves, but Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to lay this today, a little bit of this today, and then we'll carry on. So Paul is writing to the church in Galatians, and he says this. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God, thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on a promise. But God, in his grace, gave it to Abraham through a promise. But God gave it to Abraham, as we've just read, as a promise. I'm going to keep going. Jesus said this, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Malachi chapter three, keep moving forward. Malachi chapter 3. I'm going somewhere with this. Stay with me. See, I will send a messenger who will prepare 
the way before me. Who's he talking about? Sound familiar? Who is preparing the way for Jesus? Okay. Then suddenly, the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant who you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. Who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like the refiner's fire. I, the Lord, do not change. Bring the whole tithe. Everyone say bring. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And test me in this, says the Lord God Almighty, and see that I don't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out such a blessing that you do not have enough room for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines of your field, and they will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land says the Lord God Almighty. This is prophesying to us. John the Baptist was the forerunner. The temple is us. It's not a physical temple. Paul says in, to the church in Corinth, he says, you are now, you now are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So when God says bring, he's not saying give. Give. You can't give something that already belongs to him. The tithe belongs to the Lord. The tithe means 10%. It is holy unto him. It belongs to him. So we don't give our tithe. We don't pay our tithe. We bring our tithe into the storehouse. The storehouse is the local church. Where you live, the family, the house, where you get fed. And I believe that when we follow this principle, it's a biblical principle, which, by the way, was established 430 years before the law was given on Mount Sinai. So when you hear or you've heard, well, that's law. It's not law. The tithe was established with a covenant with our father Abraham before the law. Okay. Shall I keep reading? Okay. Pretty passionate about this. So when we bring and we release to God what belongs to God, he releases everything, that, the blessing that belongs to us. Genesis chapter 30, 17. Oh, I love this. Don't you love the word of God? When Abraham, Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the Lord Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between you and me, and I will greatly increase your number. Abraham fell face down, and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abraham. Your name will now be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make, listen to this, I will make, I will make a covenant with you. I will establish my covenant with you as an everlasting covenant between you and me and your descendants after you for generations to come. Do you know that we're part of that generation? We are the generations to come. We're talking about our father, Abraham, who made a covenant with God. Tithing is not a law issue. Tithing is not an Old Testament issue. Tithing is not a New Testament issue. Tithing is a covenant issue. Because we serve a covenant keeping God who made a covenant with our father Abraham. Tithing is not law. It started before the law. But it's a principle that works. And it's very clever of God to say to call it the tithe because it's so clear no matter what, eco, what economy you're in, what, whatever tribe, nation, generation, a tenth is a tenth. Yes, right. And it belongs to him. Yes. Yes. Right. It's his. 
So we don't give it to God. We don't pay it. We bring it into the storehouse. And what I love about it is there's a promise that comes with that. That you will be so blessed. I had this thought the other day. Someone told me, well, about only about 40% of Christians tithe. And I said, well, that means 60% of heaven's windows are closed. I, have you ever wondered, I wonder what would happen if we, we actually really, wherever there's a promise, there's an if. If we went back to the prefix and we looked at the ifs and we said, God, I'm going to look at this. Because Peter says we can hasten the day of his return. We can, another translation says we can hurry it along. We can bring Jesus back. If you ask yourself this question, what will the church look like one second before Jesus comes back? If you can answer that question, and if you can't, just think about it for the next few years. And then work backwards. And you'll find it starts with me. It starts in Jerusalem. It starts right here. It starts in Bath. It starts in our family. But I just wonder. I, I have, I've traveled, I had the privilege of traveling all over the world. I've never, ever met somebody who was in poverty that actually wanted to stay that way. God wants us, praise people, blessed. Blessed to be a blessing. Biblical prosperity is not having enough money to go and buy yourself an aeroplane. I don't know why you want an aeroplane anyway. It's a waste of money on fuel. But, but, but biblical prosperity is having enough to meet my needs and more than enough to bless someone else. So can I be bold enough to say there's something selfish about not wanting to be blessed? Because, oh, I don't want to be blessed. Oh, I don't want too much. But then you've got nothing to bless someone else. And the world is waiting for us, the church. All creation is waiting with eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. Come on, church. I, I said I was going to provoke you. Is this okay? You've got me for a few weeks, so. But, but church, I, I'm, I'm passionate about this. Because these, God's principles work. They really, really work. And I, I, I wonder if we'll follow, imagine if everybody followed the principles in the Bible. If we just, well, ever there's a draw near to God and he'll draw near to you, I'm going to do that. Seek first. We did a whole year on K1, do you remember that? Seek first to realign everything we did five years ago. Everything we do, is it kingdom first? Is it K1, K1, K1? Mountain of the Lord. Is it first are we seeking? Because if we do, the promises and all these things will be added unto you as well. Why is it we pick and choose Old Testament and New Testament when it suits us? Hello? The joy of the Lord is your strength. Nope, Old Testament. You want me to carry on? I got a few lists. Oh, okay. So, whew, I, I, I believe that the obeying God, obedience, is directly attached to our authority. Yes, it is. And I believe when we're not, when we are disobedient, when we don't walk in the principles, I'm talking about principles in the Bible, right? I'm not talking about laws. I'm talking about principles. When we live in the principles of the Bible, they work. And we have authority. Acts 19, 15, they said, Jesus we know, Paul we know, but who the heck are you? <laughs> and the demons beat the disciples up and strip them naked. Hello? Uh, like, who, got, who do you think you guys are? You don't have any authority. But if we know who we are, we will not be overcome. And it's something when you just know, if you do what is right. Do you remember Cain and Abel? He's, God says, Cain, why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? So, I want to just leave you with this, and then we're going to break bread. I want to provoke us to follow this, this principle and see what happens. The Bible says, test me in this. Test me and see that I don't bring so much provision into this house. And I'm just talking about just our house, individual, but God's house. 
I wonder what would happen if the mountain of the Lord will be the chief mountain and the world will come to Zion and say, teach us your ways. Do we have something to say about debt? Or are we so laden with debt? This church building was completely debt free. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. <laughs> um, let's get it debt free again. And well, we can do it really quick. We really can. I, I, I wasn't going to say this today, but can, can I ask that next week that we bring an offering into the house of the Lord? Just hear me to the end. That we bring it. And I don't know how, and we'll just we'll wait on God this week. And I want to ask all of you. But, 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 and I'm not, I, but when we bring in this offering, I just do I have a heap offering. And I believe it will, it will, like a chiropractor, it will adjust something in us as far as trusting God. Ugh. But, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um, I think we should give it into our city. All of it. That's just a thought. That we take the money. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 14, 23 says, the purpose of the tithe is to teach you the fear of the Lord. Proverbs says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The purpose of the tithe, watch this, the purpose of the tithe is to teach us to fear God, the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is the very beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning. It's, so when we tithe, we start to get wise. God does not need our money. He can open a, a fish's mouth and pull out a coin. But there's something in the principle of tithing that if we will bring the first of which belongs to the Lord and bring it into the storehouse, the promise is there will be food in their house. And guys, for, the, for any cynics in here, I'm not talking about, uh, well, about the, all the pastors that don't get paid enough money. I'm not talking about that. I have, I, I, if you like, I have a, more of a right to say this because I don't receive a, t- a salary from the church here. Okay? So uh, this, there's not an angle here, those who are like, what's, what's the angle here? I'm talking about a principle that comes with the blessing, with covenant blessing. I'll say it again. Tithing is not a law. I'm not talking about tithing under the law. I'm, t- I'm not talking about... Old Testament or New Testament, I'm talking about a covenant-keeping God that made a covenant with our father Abraham. And it's an everlasting covenant that comes from one generation to the next generation and for the generations to come, and that is us. And if we'll do it, not only will we be debt-free, but there'll be that this, this, this church will become a breadbasket for the city. And the church that start in Jerusalem, everyone say Jerusalem, let's start in Bath, start where you are and say, okay, let's start touching our city. Let's, t- let's bring a heap offering and say, let's bring it. And then every single penny of it, we say, now God, how can we pour it into our city? And let's start here in Jerusalem. Let's start here in Bath. Do follow this principle. And church, one of the things I love about the trustees here, they are people of absolute integrity, they're people who have honor, they love God, they pray, they are, and, and it's just a joy. I don't even like going to trustees meetings because I just don't, all the numbers don't really make sense to me. But I, my job is just to preach a, a principle. I know time's gone. And, and, and I think God's going to do something amazing. God's going to break something. He's going to break poverty spirits. He's going to break fear. He's going to break something. And we're going to see God begin to move. And, some, and we're going to start getting wise. Because the purpose of the tithe is to teach you the fear of the Lord, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. Amen. Can we just break bread before we finish today? Is that okay? Okay. I know you're wondering what the apple is, but you have to wait till next week. Okay. I'm going to just say this. Those of you who are new, this will, I'm just going to recap. Just stay with me. I'll do, I can do this in three minutes. We were once... All of us in darkness. Say darkness. That's you lot, sorry. And then, because of the gospel, we were transformed from one domain of darkness into the marvelous kingdom of light. That's you lot. You're the kingdom of light, okay? All right. See this cross behind me? Everything happened because of the cross. Everyone say cross. Stay with me. Really interact now and I'll go fast, okay, right? Okay, so we were in darkness. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 11. 
that was, I read, let's read it together. I know I've taught this before, but I, I, want, I believe this is, gonna, this is powerful for today because it's going to break something. Therefore, whoever drinks, whoever, whoever eats the bread and the wine, or the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. A man need to, ought to examine himself before he takes the bread and drinks the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. This, for this reason, everyone say for this reason, singular. For this reason, for this reason, the unworthy manner, for that reason, whoever comes to the table of the Lord in an unworthy manner, can I please make a point? Paul is not talking about a person. He's not talking about you. He's not talking about me. He's talking about a manner in which we approach the table of the Lord. For this reason, some of you are weak, some of you are sick, and some of you have died prematurely. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, to Telestai, it is paid in full. It is finished. And he took us from the domain of darkness and he transferred us because of the divine exchange that happened on the cross and he brought us into the marvelous kingdom of light. And the church, the purpose of the church is to extend the kingdom to the ends of the earth. Okay? So if Paul says, this is why some of you are weak, sick, and you've died prematurely, the reason, for this reason, because you've taken the cup, you've taken the bread, you've taken the cup in an unworthy manner. Therefore, I want to suggest to you, the way we take it in an unworthy manner is not recognizing the power of the cross. That's the unworthy manner. Not recognizing the fullness of what Jesus did on the cross. We were once slaves. We were sinners. But now we are sons and we are daughters. And we are saints. Paul never wrote to the, to the slaves in Ephesus or Colossae or Philippi. He wrote to the saints. Why? Because he's writing to the church who is the kingdom, living in the marvelous kingdom of light. So church, the opposite therefore must be true. When we take the, the cup and we take the bread in a worthy manner, the opposite is true. We become strong, healthy, and we live a long life. That also is the covenant blessing that God made in the order of Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14. He brought out the bread and he brought out the wine and the tithe and said, let's make a covenant together. The cross was the fulfillment of that. Jesus' body, his, the bread was broken so that we could be whole. And the blood was spilt for the forgiveness of our sin. So I'm gonna ask Nigel if he'll come up and start to administrate and the musicians to come. And today I just want us to flood the front under Nigel's instruction of how we're gonna take communion together. But this may be the first time for some of you to have fully understood, or maybe your eyes got enlightened today, that this is what the table of the Lord is all about. I grew up in this house, I used to sit at the back, and whenever the table of the Lord would come, I was in so much shame by things going on in my life, I'd always say pass. And then the stewards would be like, yeah, right, you should pass. Uh, <laughs> but, but church, I've come to realize I can come boldly before his throne of grace as a son. And so I want to challenge you. If you know Jesus today, come with confidence. Come with your head lifted up and come to the table of the Lord and honor what happened on the cross. Honor the finished work. By his stripes we were healed for the forgiveness of sin, for the healing of our bodies. And let's break bread together and enjoy this covenant. Amen. Let's all stand together.